Pakshmani, islands, Vishnu, personality of Godhead Shri Vishnu, Ahani, the day and night, Ube, both, Cha, and Tat, his, blue eyebrows, uh, Vijramba, movements, Parameshti, the supreme entity, Brahma, Dishnyam, post, Apaha, Varuna, director of water, Asya, his, Talu, palate, Rasa, juice, Eva, certainly, Jiva, the tongue. Translation, the sphere of outer space constitutes his eye pits and the eyeball is the sun as the power of seeing. His eyelids are both the day and night and in the movement of his eyebrows, uh, the Brahma and similar personalities reside. His palate is the director of water, Varuna, and the juice or essence of everything is his tongue. Purport to common sense, the description of this verse appears to be somewhat contradictory because sometimes the sun can be described as the eyeball and sometimes as the outer space sphere. But there's no room for common sense in the injunctions of the Shastras. We must accept the description of the Shastras and concentrate more on the form of the Rupa than on common sense. Common sense is always imperfect, whereas the description in the Shastras is always perfect and complete. If there is any incongruity, it is due to our imperfection and not the Shastra. That is the method of approaching Vedic wisdom. Translation, the sphere of outer space constitutes his eye pits and the eyeball is the sun as the power of seeing. His eyelids are both the day and night and in the movement of his eyebrows, Brahma and similar supreme personalities reside. His palate is the director of water, Varuna, and the essence or juice of everything is his tongue. So this continues the description of the universal form Virat Rupa or Vishwa Rupa, uh, which is explained in many places in the Bhagavatam and also in the Bhagavad Gita. And it was actually revealed by Krishna to different personalities, such as Arjuna on the battle of Kurukshetra, or to Duryodhan. Uh, when he went to visit him to try to negotiate a peaceful settlement before the war. Or even to Mother Yasoda, when Mother Yasoda looked in Krishna's mouth and she saw the whole universe there. So we have uh, several instances where this uh, universal form is not exactly imaginary, it actually becomes visible to everybody uh, when the Lord so desires. Nevertheless, we call it imaginary uh, because it's not a spiritual form of the Lord. It's uh, the material elements. Uh, now, so in these verses here, we uh, previously saw how the whole planetary systems were uh, a body of the Lord. And here we see how the uh, different elements, our bodies, are parts of the Supreme Lord also. Uh, so the concept of elements in the Vedas is different from uh, modern scientific theory. In modern theory we have maybe 110 or 115 elements, I don't know how many there are, but something like approximately 100 and something elements, uh, some of which are very rare and unstable, and some of which are very common, like oxygen and whatever, carbon, uh, etc. Uh, so these are uh, modern concept is um, very you could say gross in conception, uh, and the uh, the Vedic conception of elements is quite different as we see here. The elements uh, in the Vedic list of elements we have the senses included, which we will say well the senses are made up of material elements like you know different chemicals are in your sense of the eye or your hand or whatever so it's 
in, in a modern sense, the, the senses don't look like they are elements at all. They're just combinations of elements. Uh, but uh, the concept of the sense in the Vedas is a little different. They admit that this, yes, this is the eye and the hands and the feet. These senses are made up of elements, definitely. They talk about the sense differently. The sense is something that is invisible. <laughs> We have a subtle sense, a subtle eye, a subtle nose, a subtle ear, a subtle tongue, subtle hand, subtle feet. And these go with the jiva when he leaves the body. So in other words, we, in our subtle body we have senses, and in our gross body we have senses. So we have two pairs of senses in one sense. Of course, we have the spiritual sense and the atma also, so we have three, three levels of senses, <laughs> sense perception. It's a little complicated, but um, this is uh, the Vedic conception that the, the senses actually are the subtle senses that we're speaking of here when we talk about the elements. Yeah? Uh, so we have the eye and the ear and the tongue, etc., as uh, elements. And then we have gross material elements like water, air, ether, fire, etc. So the gross elements combine to make the eye or the hand or the foot. But separately we have this, these other elements, the hand and the foot and the eye, which are the subtle elements. So these are more or less eternal. They are part of, just like uh, we'll think of the material world and we'll analyze everything in terms of elements. Uh, so. If we analyze the whole matter, senses are there as components of matter itself. When matter is created before they form into bodies or anything, uh, the, the senses are there. Those subtle senses are already there. Uh, which implies that in the universe, the whole purpose of the universe is not simply uh, making some blobs of matter. Uh, and then sometimes we get water and oceans and things like that, but the we have the senses there already in it, so they have to form into bodies, the senses. Huh? So in other words, the whole purpose of uh, Prakriti is to make bodies that can exist within planets and different environments, and inside that there's a jiva, there's a soul in each of these bodies. So the, through the jiva experiences this world through subtle senses, which turn into gross senses. <laughs> so we've got these two senses operating. Yeah? And when we leave our material body and we die and we go to another body, we take our senses with us. So that once you're out of this body, you can still perceive with that subtle body. Uh, so this also accounts for the fact that you can have experiences in hellish planets and then come back to another gross body. <laughs> that. It also explains why uh, you can have experiences in dreams when your eye and your ear are not really operating, technically speaking, but the subtle senses are operating then. It also explains why uh, if you have a near-death experience, you can perceive things there. And in fact, you can actually perceive the gross world there. So we have people who relate how when their heart stops and their brain stops or whatever, and they're so-called dead or whatever for a few minutes, they go out of their body and they can perceive their body. And they can even perceive the doctors looking at their body and trying to revive the body. They can perceive people talking, the nurses talking, the doctors talking, etc. very accurately. <laughs> even though they're brain, brain dead and this brain's not operating, the senses are not operating, but they can perceive people speaking and people doing things. They can see and they can hear, even though their brain's not operating and their eyes not operating. So how do they do that? Because they have that subtle eye, subtle ear, etc. operating on the subtle body. This is, of course, mysterious for modern science because they don't know about the subtle body, but this is an explanation we can give for that, that the subtle sense is still operating when the gross sense isn't. So, uh, in this way, we have I guess, a little bit of a confirmation that we do have two sets of senses, the very gross one, which stops operating when you die, and then decays with the body, 
or, or gets burnt, whatever. And then we have the subtle ones that keep going with you. And they're in your subtle body. But generally, that subtle body with the jiva is unstable. So it must take another gross body uh, to get satisfactory experience in this world <laughs> and uh, to fulfill karma that we want to enjoy in this material world. So therefore you're pushed into another gross body and then you get another set of gross senses to operate with here in the gross body. Uh, so the uh, Vedic conception is a little bit different from modern conception but it can also explain some of the unexplainable phenomena that we come across in the modern world when we uh, have these things like near-death experiences, etc. Huh? Uh, so we have these, all these senses existing on a subtle level, uh, but they have to combine together these subtle senses in a certain way and operate nicely. Uh, so there has to be some principle behind putting everything together. <laughs> so we have the creator, Brahma, uh, who uh, takes the material elements and these very subtle elements, the senses, and he does two things. He makes places or lokas, planetary systems, and we said there are 14 levels according to levels from gross consciousness to elevated consciousness for living beings. And the, the matter themselves is either gross or subtle. So all the way up to Earth we have very gross planets. And when we go above the earth, uh, from, from Bhuvar and Svarga, Mahajana, Tapa and Brahmaloka, the elements get more subtle, so we can't even see those planets technically when we get up into that sphere. Okay? And then we have living entities living on all these planets. So Brahma makes the bodies for these living entities and they can live in the hellish planets or the earth planet or Bhuvar Loka, the ghost planets, or Sparga Loka, heavenly planets, or above that. And they have suitable bodies to live in those particular places. Uh, so again, because these bodies are more finer and subtler than our body, we can't even see many of these bodies. So we cannot see the bodies of the Devatas and people on Sparga Loka, or even the ghosts in the, in the Bhuvar sphere just above us. Huh? So, in this way, uh, Brahma combines the senses, uh, the subtle senses that are there and the elements, and the gross elements makes bodies with the, both layers, the gross, uh, the gross aspect and the subtle aspect. And there's a jiva inside there, so that the jiva can experience this world and enjoy it, do activity, create karma, and then get another body, according to his karma. And this way, the jiva gets body after body, and according to the body, he'll go to different levels. He can go upwards or downwards or whatever. He can get higher and higher body and go to higher and higher planets, according to karma. He can stay at the earth level, or he can go down, down, down to grosser bodies, according to his sinful activities, whatever. So, in this way, uh, we have a very intricate system um, planned out by Brahma, the creator within the material world, uh, so that the jivas can enjoy with a material body, a gross body and a subtle body. Uh, so uh, these subtle senses are involved here. Uh, so these are explained in these verses here, how the universal form has the eye and uh, it's, it sees, etc. And behind that there's a devata who also controls that uh, sense organ uh, uh, and thus uh, if they're operating properly then the jiva can see or the universal form is able to see and that way experience uh, so with the eye what do you do with the eye you see things the forms so that's called the 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 the, the, the perception of the eye uh, its capacity to perceive things uh, uh, it's called its tanmatra, or its sense object. So form is the sense object for the eye. And if we can perceive nicely, then we get some enjoyment out of seeing those different forms in the material world. Yeah. And all this goes for all the different senses. So with each sense, we get a certain type of uh, function, and then 
the jiva can get some enjoyment out of that particular function. So we have seeing and hearing sounds and smelling fragrances and whatever, and tasting different uh, flavors, whatever, touching things, hard, soft, whatever, like this. Um, and in this way, the, the jiva is able to get some enjoyment out of the material world. It is all, of course, material thing. It's a, the, the, the sense is material. It has its subtle aspect and its gross aspect, uh, but it's all m matter. And it contacts matter also. The sense object, the forms are all material. The fragrance is material. Uh, uh, the sound is material. So it is matter contacting matter, basically. <laughs> huh? uh, a material eye contacting a material form and then getting some experience of happiness or pain that way. How is it possible? Because the experiencer is not material at all. The experiencer is this little soul, the Atma, the Jiva, who is non-material. So how can you get enjoyment out of matter contacting matter? You cannot. <laughs> so it's a very unnatural position to try to do so. Huh? But if we misidentify and then that Atma thinks I am this body, I am this matter, he identifies with the, this, this body with the senses, then he can begin to enjoy he can experience some enjoyment out of that because he misidentifies with his body and his senses and the brain and whatever and his neurons in the brain or whatever that gives him the sense that I'm happy with this. This is uh, what we call false identity or ahankara. But this is another material element, a very subtle, m most subtle material element almost called ahankara, false ego. Yeah? And with that element, the soul, which is spiritual, identifies with material body and its senses. And then it, the senses contact the sense objects and it goes to the brain and they say, I'm happy. <laughs> or I'm suffering. Yeah. So therefore, uh, it's not natural because the soul is completely different. But by misidentity, then we think this is happiness. So this is the condition of everyone in the material world with material bodies. And this is called ignorance. Huh? And from the spiritual point of view, ignorance is not good. So therefore, it's a not a natural position to be in. Huh? And in this position of ignorance, we experience some happiness. We experience some unhappiness or distress or suffering. We get this duality. Huh? And we have an experience, I want the happiness out of certain objects or I don't like the pain I'm getting out of the other objects. So based on this idea of I like this and I don't like that, we do our activities in this world to get happiness and to avoid suffering. And what's the result of that? We get some experience of uh, false happiness <laughs> through misidentity plus added effect, karma. <laughs> we get karma. Each of the activities to get some happiness or to avoid some distress, that activity gives a karma. We get a future result in terms of our next body, which is either happiness or suffering. And so if you do your activity of avoiding, uh, trying to avoid the suffering and getting the happiness, and you do it in the wrong way, then you get suffering in your future life. If you do it in an approved way, according to scripture, then you get happiness in your next lifetime. All material, of course. So it's a rather complex system. <laughs> but it is that system is devised to educate the jiva. To understand, avoid the pain, get the happiness, but do so by the proper methods. <laughs> then you can be more peaceful in this world. That's the education. So, so you avoid the sinful activities, the violent activities, the harmful activities, and you do the activities which are charitable and peaceful and whatever. Huh? And this way, uh, there's a natural cultivation of goodness in the jiva to do better and better because he wants to avoid pain and get happiness. Huh? 
So that's, that's the, the, the general idea behind the law of karma and getting all these senses, etc. As I said, the whole thing is actually illusory because it's based on the false concept that I'm the body. <laughs> and therefore, the jiva ultimately cannot get happy. Even if he thinks he's happy, it's not real happiness. It's false. Uh, so we have the example um, of the two examples. <laughs> One is the, the fish. Hmm? Uh, so the fish is very happy in the water. Yeah. And uh, fish eat whatever they eat in the water and they, they can breathe in the water and do whatever they want in the water. They reproduce and have their families in the water, etc. And they're very happy going on surviving like that. So that's the natural environment for the fish. Um, as human beings, we can be a little bit in, over intelligent and say, well, look, the fish is actually not enjoying so nicely because he has to sit under the water all the time and, you know, all he has to do is eat a few bugs or whatever that come along or worms or <laughs> like this. So let's, let's promote the fish and give him some more happiness. So we take the fish out of the water, we sit him down, put him in a nice house, and then we start giving him all sorts of nice luxury foods like caviar or whatever and <laughs> wine and uh, expensive foods and stuff. And they say, here, enjoy. Very, very nice. So what happens to the fish? He cannot enjoy. He only suffers. Why? Because it's not natural. So the, the soul with his material body in this world trying to get his enjoyment is like that fish out of water. <laughs> But unfortunately, he's like a fish that's a little intoxicated and he's out of the water. He said, maybe I can enjoy in this out of the water. After all, he goes into some illusion and tries to enjoy. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, a natural position of the soul in the material world in ignorance. He, he's actually suffering, but he thinks, oh, this is happiness. Yeah? Uh, so um, If we are in ignorance, then we tend to get caught up into this endeavor for happiness of the material body. And uh, we lose sight of the fact that actually it's not so enjoyable after all. And we get so absorbed in trying to pursue that happiness, we forget that it doesn't really give happiness at all. Okay? Uh, but then when we end our life, we realize, oh, this is all useless. <laughs> Uh, so there's the, another example, and that is the example of the bird in the cage. So uh, we have a bird, and he has a nice cage. So we, then we have the the um, the owner, the owner of the bird. So the owner of the bird feeds the bird every day, hmm, keeps the bird happy, etc. Whatever. But if the owner is foolish. Mm. And he'll be looking at the outside, the cage, and he'll start thinking, well, uh, this is the cage, I should improve the cage. Uh, so then he gets a, uh, buys a new cage, um, maybe he gets a gold cage or what, puts a few diamonds on the corners of it or whatever like that, makes it look beautiful. And he gets uh, very absorbed in decorating the cage. And he forgets to feed the bird inside. <laughs> so the bird dies. So that's our absorption in our material body. We're trying to take care of our body and then find the happiness this way or that way, etc. And we become so absorbed in that, we forget about the soul completely. And meanwhile, the soul's sitting there like the dying bird, not getting any food. <laughs> so this is, our, again, our ignorance in the material world. So we have this very it's like complex system of the subtle senses, the gross senses, the subtle body, the gross body. Okay. So the gross body is the one that uh, reminds us that you're not eternal. You cannot have eternal happiness with your body. The body grows, it matures, it declines, then it dies. And everyone has to realize that as they progress in life. So therefore they must realize sooner or later that I can't really enjoy nicely because I want eternal happiness, but I can't get it in this body. <laughs> so this should make them question that what should I do if I shouldn't get happiness out of this material body? Unfortunately, even people don't even ask that question, but that's the whole purpose of the body, that gross body, to make you realize that it's all going to be very temporary. Yeah? There's a the, the question by 
uh, Yamaraj actually, who comes as a, a yaksha <laughs> to test Yudhisthir. And one of the questions he asks is, what is the most astonishing thing in this world? Yeah, so you think what's most astonishing, it's a big mountain or a big river, a wonderful flower, a ferocious beast or whatever, or a hero or whatever, that, who's the, what's the most astonishing thing? So Yudhisthir was very intelligent because he's actually the son of Dharma or Yamaraj. Yeah. So he says the most astonishing thing in this world is that everybody dies. We all know we're going to die and we all see everybody else die. So we see our grandparents die, we see our parents die, we see other people die uh, all the time. It's always happening. In spite of this, we think, I'm not going to die. <laughs> and we go on peacefully living our life as if nothing's ha happened at all. And we don't think about anything that we're going to die sooner or later and what happens after that. We don't think about that at all. We just give a go on living. See, this is the most astonishing thing in the world. We have a blunt fact in front of us that everybody is mortal, but we never live with that fact and act in a proper way. It's like a person who um, is renting a house. Hmm? So we pay our rent every month and then it goes on. But then the landlord comes and he says, well, next month you have to get out of your house. Yeah. So then an intelligent person will look for another house. And he also save up some money so he can get the right house that he wants to uh, rent. Yeah. So that's the intelligent thing to do. The unintelligent person will ignore the landlord. Maybe he's just fibbing or lying or whatever, we don't know. <laughs> or he forgets or whatever. And then the end of the month comes, and what happens? He gets kicked out of the house. <laughs> he's got nowhere to go. So that's foolish. Yeah? But this is what happens to the human being. We don't really think about what happens afterwards. What's my real goal in life? Should I do something else other than just maintain my body and maintain my family? Is there some higher goal for me? He doesn't think like that. And then suddenly he's dead. No preparation for the future at all. And that's the position of the human being. We're, we're stuck in the body at the moment and we're not thinking of the future of the body or their next body that we'll get or anything. And what's our destination next? Stuff. So this is the uh, short-sightedness of the human being. In spite, of, in spite of the fact we do have intelligence, somehow we just forget this. <laughs> Why? Because we're overcome by it everything in this world and our body. We get so attached to it. This uh, hunkara, this false identity is so strong, we're overcome by it, this identity completely. But this, so that is the ignorance, the profound ignorance of this material world. We're, we're really in illusion. <laughs> so that is why the, the scriptures keep telling us this whole thing is maya, it is all false, it is all temporary, um, it is all illusory. Uh, please remove that illusion so you can be happy. Yeah? There's constant um, uh, reminders of this. So from one point of view, we say, oh, why be so pessimistic about this world, etc.? <laughs> why are the scriptures so uh, condemning? Uh, why do they dismiss this world as being useless like that? And so, well, this is the reason, because we tend to forget, we get so absorbed in our body that we are so attached to it, we can't think of anything else. So, the scriptures try to wake us up out of that illusion. And to do that, then they have to be a little harsh sometimes. It is all nonsense. You're a fool. <laughs> Wake up from this illusion. Uh, and we have many examples later in the Bible, in particular, fifth canto and I think fourth canto, they tell stories of people dying and what happens to them, <laughs> like this, just to wake us up and show the miseries of uh, material life and how we have to struggle throughout life. Huh? Uh, so, uh, behind this, there is a big purpose. Uh, the idea is there's a purpose. So the, the, it's a little bit indirect. So, so the purpose in this material world is we have these bodies which are constructed according to a certain plan with senses so that we can perceive. Okay? So we can use the senses to enjoy in the material world and that's what the jiva wants to do. He wants to enjoy in the material world. So he gets a body and enjoys material objects, even though it's unnatural. It's one purpose. The second purpose is to use the same body and the same senses to understand that he's not the body <laughs> and he should get out of this position. 
So that's the great blessing that the uh, Lord arranges, the double function of our body intelligence. We can use it materially to continue our uh, life in the prison house here, or we can use the same body and senses and intelligence as mine to get out of the prison. So that's the, 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 the way the Lord has created the, uh, the body, particularly the human body. And thus the human body is considered to be very, a, a great treasure. If you get a human birth, uh, then you should utilize that birth as a human being to pursue this goal of spiritual life and understand you're not the body, you're the soul. And if you don't do that, it's a waste. And you can go back to your lower bodies where you don't have the intelligence to do that. Yeah? So, uh, therefore, the whole purpose of the uh, getting this material body is to educate us, uh, finally, to uh, get out of the material world and then utilize those same senses and body and mind and intelligence to discern and realize the ultimate goal. And then ultimately, the goal is to realize another form, not the Varat-Rupa form of material bodies and the big uh, universal body, but to realize the form of the Supreme Lord. That's the ultimate purpose. So it is gradual. So um, this is the, the first step. Meditate on the universal form. At least understand there's some form behind, some plan behind this whole material world. And beyond that, then we have to go higher and higher and realize there's a spiritual purpose and then a spiritual form of the Lord behind that. Uh, okay, any question? Stable. Oh, it's unnatural here. Yeah. Oh, he's in the subtle body. Yeah. 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 Gross body. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if we just have the subtle body and not the gross body, it is not really satisfying to the jiva because uh, the jiva wants to enjoy the sense objects, but with the subtle body, without the gross body, you really cannot do that. So therefore he wants to take another gross body so that he has the two sets, the, the gross and the subtle, then he can start enjoying objects of this world. To some extent, you can get a little kind of experience with the subtle senses apart from the body, as we see with the uh, near-death experience, so you can perceive a little bit and whatever like, but it's, it's not too well controlled there. <laughs> so you can't really enjoy in that state. Huh? However, the, the gross body, the get may be grosser or subtler also. So if you're in the lower planetary systems of Earth, we have quite gross body. If you're in a heavenly planet, then that gross body is also very subtle. And you go to Brahmaloka, that, that, that gross body is made out of Mahapattva or something like that. Very, very subtle. So even, even the gross body is very subtle as you go up. But nevertheless, they have that gross body plus that subtle body so you can get your enjoyment out of this material world. And if it's only the subtle body, then there's a, it's not possible for any, in most cases. So either it's all enjoyed spiritually or just much only it's going to enjoy before you fall down and upright. The the soul has got to, to be stable. Well, the, re yeah, the, the, real, the real stability is not just having a gross and subtle body and enjoying the material because that's unnatural. <laughs> but that's what, as far as jivas in the material world, that's their happiness. If they can get a gross and a subtle body, <laughs> at least they can get some sort of satisfaction out of that. But as I said, ultimately the soul has got nothing to do with the soul. So the soul is not satisfied. So the real stability is when the soul gets satisfied. And the soul can only be satisfied, one, by realizing it's not the body. So that's the liberation stage. I'm not the body, I'm the soul. And then we get free from the material body, gross and subtle. Second stage is to realize that we should develop our spiritual senses, our spiritual form, and then we can perceive spiritually, Supreme Lord, and develop spiritual relationships and get bliss that way. So that's the real satisfaction for the jiva. That's the stable, stable position of the jiva. Everything else is unstable. <laughs> from the absolute point of view. So therefore we say that prema uh, is the nitya dharma of the jiva. That's the eternal function of the soul, uh, that prema, or love of Krishna.
um, when, when we human beings with the growth in such a body, uh, when do, how come some people can perceive ghosts? Is that uh, Oh, how, why, why some people perceive ghosts, <laughs> uh, which are basically subtle bodies. Well, we can say there's two types of ghosts. There's the people who reside on uh, in Bhuvar's sphere, a hundred yojanas above the earth. So they have more or less, uh, we say they're ghosts in one sense, but actually they have, that's their body. <laughs> they have a subtler body than us, uh, uh, grosser than the devatas, but subtler than our body. And then they have their subtle body also. Then we have people who die, but they don't get any gross body at all in any upper or lower planetary system. They're just a subtle body with a jiva and they're kind of stuck in between. Uh, they have some like, like delayed karma, <laughs> which they, they can't get into their next body for some reason or the other. Uh, so these are the ones that are the frustrated ghosts that we see in this world that attack people and try to get into their bodies or whatever like that. Those type of their, the other usual type of ghosts we have. So, well, can you see them or not? Uh, well, they have little machines, I think, nowadays. You can kind of perceive the orbs or something, the little flashy lights in the dark or something. Some electronic devices there, you can kind of perceive it like that. Or maybe you can perceive a little bit with the eye. It is said that, um, of course, you could perceive them because they do have a little bit of force. Um, in other words, they can move objects to a small degree. So therefore, they, if they walk across the floor, then they creak, creak, creak. <laughs> footsteps, you could hear a little bit with the creaking boards or something like that. But not a full footstep, maybe. Or they could move a curtain, maybe, like this a little bit. Uh, or turn a page in a book, maybe. Uh, that much force they may have. So in that sense, perceptible a little bit. And perhaps they can even be seen a little bit. And their form, a subtle form, can be seen slightly. Uh, not so much, you know. And not in a controlled way also. Well, if you, yeah, if you want to, you can develop the consciousness on the level, you could go to the ghost level and perceive ghosts, or if you, other spirits are maybe not ghosts, but they're, they have subtler bodies in us, like uh, Gandharvas or Rakshasas or Yakshas or whatever, <laughs> then you can perceive those beings also, or Kinnaras or Kimparushas or whatever. So if you have the level of, con or Devatas, even if you have the consciousness, you can see a Devata. So depending on your consciousness level, you can do that. And of course in India they have certain sadhanas, in the Western world also black magic and stuff by which you can also invoke the service of other beings or ghostly beings or whatever like that, and then you can talk to them or use them or get controlled by them or whatever. A little dangerous, but yeah, there's, there's methods of doing that. So that's what they call black magic in India or whatever, Tantra and stuff like that. Okay, Hare Krishna.